Hello, in this lecture, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, homogeneous linear equations with constant coefficients. Okay? Um, so I'm going to kind of review a little bit for the first order and then use that idea uh, so that we can come up with a strategy to solve a, a second order linear differential equation with constant coefficients. Okay? All right. So, okay. let's say we have uh, the following differential equation here. So let's say we have a, pro, a times y prime plus b times y equal to zero, uh, where we have certain conditions on a and b, that is where a is not equal to zero and b, okay, uh, so b, a and b are both constants. All right, so this type of differential equation we have here, just basically a first order homogeneous differential equation, um, we can use um, separation variables since this is separable. Uh, we can also use the integrating factor technique, okay, that, um, that you all have seen before, okay? So let's just, uh, let's go ahead and, um, Go through that, right? Let's use uh, separation of variables, okay? So by, we can do that by isolating y prime, right? We can easily do that uh, because of the way it's, uh, because of this, because of the specific form here. So we're gonna get, uh, basically we have y prime equals to minus b over a, times y, okay? And b over a, those are constants, right? So b and a are constants, so this is just a constant. So we can easily represent this by y prime equals to minus k times y, okay? So nothing surprising here, okay? Um, all right, where we have k is constant. Okay. So basically, right, so, so by, Go ahead and write by separate by basically separating uh, the differential, right? With this term, uh, then we can see that this gives us a little bit of an insight into the solution of this differential equation. So this tells us that, right? We have right, we have y prime here. Let's assume that uh, x is our independent variable, so we have dy dx here and y prime. Or, sorry, y. Okay. So this basically tells us that. Um, that the solution we're looking for, okay, is, right, so if we plug that in, right, whatever y is, and we take the derivative, it's going to be, this, the solution set will look like the original, um, the original function, okay, to, that matches that, okay, right, okay, so in other words, so if we have y, Right, whatever whatever this is, right? When you plug it in, it's going to be similar to when you take the derivative. It will look like the original solution for this equation here. Okay, so if you think about it, it's not too hard to see that we're going to get we're going to end up with the exponential function because when you so in general, if you have e to the x, when you take its derivative, you get e to the x. Okay. All right. Okay, so this basically tells us that y should be a function whose derivative is a constant multiple of itself. Okay, um, okay so this tells us. It's going to take on this form. Okay, so this. Right, so this tells us that the solution form uh, will be something like y equals to e to the mx. Okay. All right. So when you take the derivative of this, right, you get e to the mx times m. Okay, and then and then from there you have the constant that falls out. Okay. 
right? Okay, so let's let's do this, okay? All right, so let's take a closer look at this. Okay, so we know the solution of this will have something of this form, just, just because of the nature of, of e to the x. And we need, a, we need some kind of constant here. Um, and that's related to this constant, okay? All right. So what we can do, okay? So what, what we're trying to do here is using some intuitive reasoning, okay? So just by doing a separation of variables here, again, we can get an idea of what the solution may, may look like, all right? Okay. So we can assume that, let's go ahead and assume that the solution will take on this one, okay? Based on what we know. So what we can do is we can plug this back into there, and then that way we can see, or we can determine what the specific M value should be, okay? So let's do that, okay? All right, so let's plug this back into, right? So we can take this and plug it back into here. Right? All right. Um, so plugging, so letting y be equal to this, we're going to plug it back into this equation, okay? into this original form. Okay, so we're gonna have a times y prime. Okay, so let's figure out what y prime is. So that is gonna be m times e to the right, e. And then we have mx, and e raised to the mx. So plugging those in. All right, so. Okay, so basically I took this, substitute here. I took the derivative of y, substitute here, okay? And then let's, then from here, what we have is we can, um, basically we can um, solve for m, okay? All right, so we can, we have a factor of e to the mx. So we can go ahead and take that out. Uh, we all know that e to the mx, right, is never going to be zero, right? So I'm just going to write this out. So from here, we can basically decouple this, right? That's what we call this. We can decouple the equation. And from here, we know that there is no solution for x, okay? And then here, Right. Obviously, we're going to get m equals to minus b over a. And that is why in the beginning, we assumed that a was not equal to zero. Okay. All right, so there, basically, that's going to give us our specific solution. So we have y equals to e, okay, raised to the minus b over a x. Okay. Okay. All right, and then, um, okay, so then, let's see, okay, all right, see what we got here, okay, and in fact, we can extend on this, um, you know, we can actually get a whole family of curves from this. So ideally, right, we have a constant here. Let's just call that C. Okay. So we can put a, so basically then we get a whole family of solutions, okay? Because what will happen is when you take the derivative of this, that's, that constant will get absorbed into another, into another constant, okay? All right. Yes. Okay, and in fact, right, this is just coming from the fact that any multiple, so any multiple of this solution, right, um, any multiple of this will satisfy this differential equation. Okay. All right. All right, so again, this was just for first order, right? So a lot, like I, like I mentioned before, okay, 
a lot of these kind of um, derivations start out with some kind of intuition of understanding what the first order solution looks like, okay? Um, which is what we did here. So, okay, so this sort of gives us an idea of what this type of solution curves will look like, okay? And then so, um, so that's how we came up with this, okay? And then we use this as a model, right? So we use this as our model. And, and so then we solve for M by plugging back into there and we get this form. And then, and then we can come up with a more general solution by multiplying by a multiple of this. Okay. All right, so in math, right? In the math world, if something works once, why not try it again, okay? So this time let's try the same type of uh, same type of logic here, uh, but this time let's focus, let's shift our focus to a second order. Okay. Good. Uh, but before I do that, let me show you, let me just show you a specific example, okay, where we can apply this. So let's say, So in this example, let's say we're solving for two times y prime plus five times y equals to zero. Okay. So let's apply this, this idea. Okay. All right. So the way, so what we need to do is we need to uh, we need to figure out what the m value, what is the specific m value? That we're using here. In other words, what is uh, right? What is M going to be? So to get to that point, what we can do is we can create what's called the characteristic equation, or sometimes they call it the auxiliary equation. Okay. So the way that's obtained is by okay. So M, you're going to let M be equal to the first order derivative. Okay. M squared will be equal to the second order. Okay. And then M cubed is going to be equal to the third order. So for this, what we're going to end up with is, since we're letting this be m, this is going to give us two times m plus five. So this is there is no right. So this is this is just y, right? It's not the first order. Okay. So we end up getting this. Okay. And then from there we can easily figure out what m is. Okay. So there is right. So basically there is your b and a, right? Okay. So then our solution. So therefore, the solution is going to be, the general solution is going to be y equals to c times e to the minus 5 house x. So just plugging it into here. Okay. So that's another way, right? So this is just another way we can solve a first order homogeneous uh, linear differential equation, okay? Right, so... All right, so we have our solution here. Okay. okay. So this, so this idea actually is how it was um, developed, in, if you, you know, in the historical sense. Okay. So, you know, so a long, long time ago, you know, came up with they were thinking about how to solve this, and then they know that okay, we can separate this, and then we have some kind of idea of what the solution looks like. And then we can go ahead and apply that to get that specific, to get the general form. All right, so, so let's now, let's try to, like I said, um, if something works once in math, let's try it again, right? So let's apply the same idea to a second order differential equation, okay? All right, so let's erase this. Okay. Okay, so for a second order differential equation. Um, that is right, second order linear differential equation.
and homogeneous, okay? Okay, so here's the second order that we're gonna look at. It's the general form. All right, so we have A times Y double prime plus B times Y prime plus C Y equals zero. Where A and B and C are constants, okay? Okay. Okay, so what we can do here, again, let's use our, and let's use our gas, okay? So let Y be equal to E to the MX. Again, if this worked for the first order, why not try it for the second order of this form, okay? So let's plug those, let's go ahead and plug those in. Um, so we have y, we need y prime. So that's going to be m times m, sorry, m times e to the mx. And then y double prime, we're going to get m squared e to the mx. So taking successive derivatives here, right? And then we're going to plug those back into here. And that way, right? So we're going to end up getting, um, we'll end up getting our auxiliary equation just as we did here. Uh, but the only difference now is that this is going to turn, this is the auxiliary equation will be second order. Okay. Right. So let's do that over here. All right. So plugging those in, let's see. All right. So we're going to get A times M squared times e to the mx plus b times m e to the mx plus c times e to the mx equals to zero. So again, just taking these, right? Plugging this into here, this one into here, and this one to here, okay? All right, and if you notice, right, we, we have a common factor again of right, the common factor being e to the mx. So we can go and factor that out. Okay. So obviously we know, right, we all know that e to the mx, um, there is no, right, there's no value that will make that equal to zero, okay? So we can sort of just put this, right, just kind of ignore that. And then we can focus on this, okay? Okay, so there is our, right? There's our auxiliary equation, okay? Or sometimes they call it the characteristic equation. All right. Okay, so here's right, here's what we have. Okay. So the solution of this second order linear homogeneous differential equation. Uh, it will depend on the type of solutions we get from here, right? Uh, because if you recall, um, this has, depending on the discriminant, right? That will tell you what type of solutions we get, okay? So basically we're going to break this down, okay? So your discriminant, right? This could have a, um, a real value discriminant, okay? Um, it could be, the discriminant could be uh, zero, Right? Or the discriminant could be less than zero. And when that's so, when the discriminant is less than zero, uh, that would tell you that, the, uh, that you end up getting uh, imaginary or complex valued solutions. Okay? okay. So let's go ahead and proceed from here. Okay, so if we solve for M, right, we can use the quadratic formula, okay, just uh, to give us this. All right. 
I'll remember that for the solution for this. Okay, we're going to have M is going to be minus or minus negative B, right? Negative B plus or minus B squared minus four times AC, all divided by 2A. Okay, so everybody, right, so everybody right, should be familiar with that. Okay, that will give us the roots uh, for this for this uh, uh, for this type of problem. Okay, for this uh, function. Okay. Okay, so all right, let's see here. Um, and here's the part that we need to know. Right, this is the important part right here. Okay. This, this is what's called the discriminant, right? And that, again, that tells you, basically that tells you the type of solutions you're gonna get, right? Um, so let's call this capital D. Okay. All right, so if, okay, so the first situation is that if, if D, is strictly bigger than zero, right? Then what happens is that we get, right? We're gonna get a value here, plus or minus the square root of whatever that is, okay? Um, and that's gonna give us a real value and then divide by two A. So we end up getting two, uh, two real and distinct solutions, okay? Okay. Second case, if D was exactly equal to zero, in other words, if the discriminant is zero, then this term, right, this part would go to zero, okay? And then we're left with just minus B over 2A. And so that tells us that we are going to have one solution, okay? And basically you get, um, because this is second order, you get uh, what's called a double root, okay? So I'm just going to say this is, you get a repeated solution here. Sometimes we say this is a double root or a root with multiplicity of two. Okay. All right. Okay, the third case is that if is that if um, the third case is d will be less than zero, d will be negative. Okay. So let's see. I'm going to make some room here. multiplicity of two, and then this one, for this case, when D is less than zero, uh, we get what's called complex roots. Now, if you remember from pre-calculus, if you have, right, if these are uh, real valued coefficients, okay, then the, and if the solutions are, sorry, if the discriminant is less than zero, then you get um, you you get imaginary solutions or complex solutions, but they occur in pairs. Okay, so you get uh, basically complex conjugates. Okay. Because this is second order, so you'll get um, you'll have two imaginary solutions, but they're complex conjugates of each other. Okay. Okay. 
So those are the three cases. All right. So let's um, so let's go through this. So let's first, so each one of these will have a different form, okay? So let's, uh, let's talk about the first case. All right, case one. All right, um, suppose, let's, let's uh, for this discussion, let's suppose that uh, you have two roots are M1 and M2, okay? And we know they're distinct, okay? So case one, distinct real roots. Okay, so we're, less, we're just letting M1 and M2 uh, be, our, uh, be our roots, okay? Okay. Okay. So let's right. So we have our roots. So we can plug it back into that form. Okay. All right. So we have y one. Okay. So one of those will be. Let's call those. Let's call one of those y one, and we'll call the other y two. So we have m one. All right. Uh, y one is equal to m one times x. Okay. Right, and then the second one will be for the other root, M2. Okay. So there's your, right, so bottom line is there's your two um, basis solutions, okay? Remember we talked about that last time. So each one of these, right, each one of these it serves as a solution for, uh, for this, for this, Okay, assuming that these are, assuming that the discriminant is bigger than zero, okay? So what we can do is we can take the linear combination of those, okay? So we can get the general solution, okay? So Y is gonna be equal to C1E to the power M1X plus C2E M2X, okay? So that's the general solution that we get for the first, for the first case, okay? All right, so let's look at case two. Or better yet, let's look at a, uh, let's look at an example, okay? A specific example. All right, let's see. Or I think what I'll do here, um, I'll just do case two. And then we'll look at an example. Okay, so that way I don't want to, I want to make sure we have this here. All right, next one was we have repeated solutions. Okay. All right, repeated roots. Okay. Now I know, so remember, so it's kind of, right? This seems kind of strange, uh, but you have to count it twice because when you, when your discriminant is zero, if you vaguely remember from pre-calculus, um, you would end up, right? When you factor it, you end up with something like, for example, let's say X minus one to the power two, okay? 
right? So let, let me describe it over here. So for example, right, you have x minus one equals to zero. So when you solve this, you get x equals to one, and let's say the squared, right? So this is basically x equals to one with multiplicity of two. Okay. So the multiplicity basically tells you um, it not it not only tells you the um, the exponent that belongs up here, but also there's all, it also tells you uh, the behavior of that function, right? The behavior of that curve around this root. Okay. So again, if you recall, um, if that's even, the function, right? The function will touch the that it will touch the x-axis at this point, and then it will go in the opposite direction. So it will either be like a U-shape or or like an upside down U shape, okay? Um, if that's odd, it's going to intersect. It's going to cross through the X axis, okay? All right. So that's, that's the, um, the reason why we've, we have this idea of multiplicity here, okay? Okay, so again, second order. So we're looking at this, right? When the discriminant is equal to zero. Okay. All right, so um, we know that because of this, we know that one of the solutions right, will be this. Okay. One of the solutions will be that form, okay? Where M1, okay, so technically we have M1 here. is equal to B over A. Okay. Really? Okay. M1 is, okay, so let's see. Uh, let me double check on that. Actually, M1, let's, yeah, let's be careful here. Not B over A. Uh, M1 will be, sorry, minus B over two. Okay, uh, again, because we're assuming that the discriminant is zero, so we get minus B over two. Okay. All right, so, um, so what we can do here is that ideally, remember, since we're dealing with second order, uh, we want to come up with a general solution that, right, that incorporates two basis solutions. Okay, so again, so like with this case, we have two solutions, we run the linear combination, and remember, uh, these are literally, these could be, right, these are actually literally independent of each other, okay? So what we can do is that, okay, we have one solution, right? Okay. Um, we can go ahead and apply the reduction of order method to this, okay? And remember, last time we talked about that, Okay, there's a formula. If you're given one of the if you're given one of the solutions for a second order differential equation, okay, then you can find the second solution. Uh, and at the same time, they're literally independent of each other. Okay, so let's apply that here. Okay. So we can find the second solution by applying the reduction of order technique. Or I can say formula here. Okay. All right. So to recall you to, to basically recall your memory of that, okay, uh, the reduction of order formula is going to be y two equals to y one, where y one is the given solution times the integral of e to, again, assuming that p is a uh, function of our independent variable, which is x, okay, that's going to be right. So e to the integral of this divided by y1 squared. Okay, 
So that's the reduction of order formula. Okay, so let's do that here. Um, okay. So we need to we need to go ahead and uh, go ahead and put our we need to go ahead and put this in standard form here. Okay, let's do that. So I'm going to go over here, erase this part. Okay. Put this in standard form. Again, all we're doing is normalizing this. All right. So remember, that's you have to normalize your differential equation in order to use this formula. Otherwise, your p of x value, your p of x uh, function will be will be wrong. All right, so let's see what we get here. Okay, so P of, P of X is in this case is just a constant. We have Y2. Y1, so Y1 is, we're assuming is this form. So we have, okay. Um, this is the general form, so we just need, remember, we don't need, we just, we don't need the constant there, we just need the, just uh, the piece of that, right? Not necessary to put the constant, right? Because what we'll do is we'll get, so I'll go ahead and just take this out. What we can do is we can go ahead and take, we'll take the linear combination at the end, just like we did for case one. Okay, so we have e to the m1x, okay? times the integral of e to the integral of b over a dx, okay, divided by uh, e to the power of m1x squared dx. Okay, so since we know m1, we can go ahead and rewrite this. Okay, so y2, okay, oh. sorry, I just want to, okay. All right, so I'm, um, all right. Um, okay, so going through the derivation for this, for the different cases. Okay. So for y2, right, we know m1, has this specific term, and that's just coming from the fact that this is zero. Okay. So this is for case two. Okay. So y2 is going to be equal to e. So m1, let's see, m1 is just b minus b over 2a. Okay. And then, in fact, I'll just keep this as m1. Oh, we can plug everything in at the end so it doesn't get so messy. And so we have integral of um, e to the integral. Let's see. It's a little messy here. Uh, let's see. Let's see. All right. So M1. Let's see. So M1, there should be a negative there. Okay, so let's see, try to see what I did here. Okay, so going back here, M1, yeah, so M1 should be minus. So there's a negative here. Okay, so it's going back here. So going back here, All right? So since M1 is equal to this, then uh, we can say that this is just 2M1, okay, equal to minus B over A. Okay. Show up there. Down to the next line. So this part is just 
uh, two times M one equals two minus B. So now going back over here, so B over A, uh, we can replace that with minus with negative two M one. Okay, let's see. So we have E two B minus B over. So let's see, minus B over two A. Yeah, so that's going to get replaced by minus. So that's minus two M one. Yeah, be careful of the sign here. So B, so let's see, negative B, so three and one. Okay, so we have I sort of lost my train of thought here. Uh, so we have minus integral. So where is negative component here? Negative B over A. I think this should be B over A. Oh, I think this should be a negative in here. Okay. All right, so then, yeah, so B over A, um, and then you have, so that's going to be equal to, so minus 2M1, so that becomes integral of 2M1. Okay, so it's just 2M1. M1 dx. Okay, and then we have on the bottom here, this just becomes two times e2 two, two m1 dx. Okay. Okay. So um, so what's gonna happen here when you take the integral of this? This becomes uh, two m1x, and then and then that's gonna cancel with this. So it works out very uh, very nicely. So let's go over here. Let's see. I'm going to erase this part. Okay. okay so y two of e m one x times the integral. This is going to be again. This is just e to the two m one times x, and we don't have to put a constant there because we, you know, we're just sticking to the uh, just to the most simple case. Okay, so obviously this is going to give us y2 equals to e to the m1x times the integral of dx. And then we can add our c. Okay. And so this is going to turn into, so we get x times e. So we have c1. So if we went to the next line here. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and erase this part. This is just going to be, so we get X here. So, okay. so we have X times E to the M1 X. So that gives us our second solution. Yeah. So the point here is that if, right, so we have, because this was zero, right, so we end up getting a double root, or in this case, I think we could say multiple, multiple, multiplicity of two. We have a solution here, okay, from basically from this, and then we apply the reduction of order formula to get the second solution. So the point is that you can multiply, you're just multiplying X by the original solution, and that keeps it linearly independent. And therefore, Okay, we can take from there, we can go ahead and take the linear combination of those. Okay, so we can write that. Let's go ahead and write that here. So your general solution will be C1 times E to the M1X plus C2 times X times E to the M1X. Okay. 
So that gives us our second solution. So let's, it's okay, yeah. Just if you have any questions or something, just let me know. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna, basically I'm gonna put, I'm gonna summarize here and then we're gonna look at some specific examples. Case one. Oh, just take real roots. We had repeated roots. Good. Um, so we'll we'll get to case three in a few minutes, but let's go through some examples. Okay, so let's see. Um, yeah, so let's say, uh, let's do that. Okay, so let's say we wanna solve this second order linear homogeneous differential equation. So first, right, we have to basically formulate our characters equation. So that's just gonna be, remember, so this is just M, right? This will be M squared. So we end up getting two times M squared minus three M plus one. And then we can go ahead and factor from here. So this just basically turns out to be minus two M plus one, and then we get times, this will just be minus M plus one. Okay. And then from there, we can easily solve for M, right? So this is gonna be M equals to one half, or we get M equals to one. So then our solution, right? Our two solutions will be, okay, we have, Okay, uh, we have y equals to, or let's say for this one, we have e to the one half x, and then we have y2, or I should say four, y2 is equal to e to the power x. And then we just take the linear combination of those. And it doesn't matter which one, you could put one half here or you can put one here. It doesn't matter because because those are just constants anyway. Okay. So that was just for the first case. Okay, let's look at a let's look at an example of the second case. So let's do that over here.
All right, so let's say we want to solve this. Um, see, y double prime minus six y prime plus nine y. So again, we can right, formulate our characters of equation. So that is going to be m squared minus six m plus nine. And so that becomes m minus three squared equals to zero. So we get basically from here we get our uh, we have a double root here so m equals three with multiplicity of two. Okay, so that means right case two. Okay, so we're going to have the general solution will be c one e to the three x plus c two times x e to the three x. Okay. Just applying it directly. That's what we derived all a while ago. Okay. All right. So we have the formulas, we derive them, we can just apply them. Right? Okay. All right. And let's see. By the way, we can extend this because so if you have, right? You can, right? So if you have a third order, right, then that's going to give you a third order characters equation. Okay. Um, and then let's assume that they're each of the, let's say you have three distinct real roots. So then, so then you would just add on the third term here. So you have this one plus this one plus, let's say, C3e to the M3x. So for each term, right, each term has its, it's basically there's a corresponding root. Right? Same thing with this one. Okay. If you have, let's say, multi, a root of multiplicity of three, then you would just take the, you would just add on another term, but then you would multiply it by another x. So you would have this one plus this one plus c2, or let's say c3 x squared e times m1x. Okay. So we'll, we'll get to that in a few minutes. Okay. okay, so let's. Look at the, uh, let's look at what happens when you get complex roots. So there we have to, uh, we end up getting complex roots. Um, our solute, we can go back and use this idea, but then we ideally, we want something that we can work with. In other words, we want something that we can plot. Um, so the idea is to take that equation and change it into, or go through some mathematics and take it and write it in terms of real value functions. All right, so let's let's do that here. So complex roots. That was for the third case. And because we're dealing with we're dealing with real coefficients, the roots, the complex values, or the complex roots are be um, they always occur in conjugate pairs. Oh, okay. So just to recall, this was the this was the um, characters equation we're working with. And so then we're looking at the case where the discriminant is uh, less than zero. Okay. 
Okay. So discriminant being this, right? So now what happens if it's less than zero? Well, we're going to get complex conjugates. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so M1, they, again, so the discriminant is less than zero. Sorry, yeah, less than zero. So you're going to get two, right, because of plus or minus here. So you're going to get two imaginary solutions. Okay. All right, so those are going to look like this. Um, so I'm using, I'm using alpha and beta as the, um, for the, um, for the real and imaginary part. So M1 will be alpha, let's let M1 be equal to alpha. Okay? So in one case, we'll have plus, for alpha plus I beta. Uh, the other case will be alpha minus I beta. So these are what I mean by complex conjugates, right? They, they have the opposite signs here. So that always happens. That always happens if your polynomial, sorry, if the coefficients of the polynomial are, are basically real valued, okay? Okay, um, so technically, yeah, we can sort of say, okay, we can stop here and say, okay, just plug M1 into M2 in here. But the problem is that um, a lot of the applications, like if, you're, if you wanna graph your solutions um, on a Cartesian plane, well, that's gonna be sort of a problem uh, because, because, we, because of these. So uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna plug those in and then go through some, um, we're gonna try and, or eventually we're going to convert this into a real value solution. Okay. Okay. So let's let's go ahead and plug those in um, to see what we get. So we have y equals to c one. So all that's multiplied by x. Two. So I plug M1 and M2 into here. So again, um, we don't want, you know, because we're, ideally we want something that we can work with, right? That we can maybe, we could plot the solution, okay? Um, so let's, we can go ahead and change this around or to put this all real values. Um, so the, um, the identity that we want to use is the Euler's identity, right? We can use Euler's identity to uh, to work with this. Okay. So that just says if you have e to the i theta, uh, then you have cosine theta plus i sine theta. Okay. All right. So very. Very famous identity, by the way. Okay. It's used all, right? It's used all throughout engineering. Okay. So we're going to apply that here. Okay. okay. Um, let's see. So, so, so this is so. Eventually, what we're going to do here is we're going to break this up. So we can say e to the alpha times e to the i beta. And we have x here, and then we can break up this. So we're going to get the forms, right? So what we want to do is figure out what e to the i beta x is and e to the negative i beta x. And we can get, so basically we can apply this to here, okay? So let's do, let's see, let's do that here, okay? Let's first figure out what e to the i beta x is, okay? So, the theta, theta is acting as bx. So it's going to be cosine of beta x plus i times sine beta x. Okay. That's just, again, just applying this spoiler's identity. Okay. And we can do the same thing okay, for, right? Uh, we have e to the minus i beta. Okay. 
Okay, so that's going to become minus plus I sine minus beta X. Um, typically, it's not good to leave the negative arguments with trig functions. We should simplify that. So let's do that. Okay. All right. Um, so we know that cosine, right? Cosine is an even function, which, right? which means that if you take cosine of minus x, right, it's going to equal to minus cosine of x. So just to recall that, okay, I'll write that here. Is a different color. Sometimes red doesn't show up too well on the video. Right? Because cosine is even, this means right? we have this, and then sine is odd. Okay. So I'm sorry. That's still negative there. And then sine is odd. So this is going to be minus sine. So cosine minus x is just equal to cosine x. Sine minus x is equal to minus sine of x. Cosine is even, sine is odd function. Okay. So applying that here. Right, we're going to end up getting, let's see, uh, we're going to get cosine beta x minus i times sine beta x. Okay. okay, so now what we can do is we can go ahead and go ahead and add these, and then eventually we'll subtract these. Okay. All right, so let's take e to the i beta x. Let's first add them together. All right, make sure I'm not going off the screen there. All right, so when we add these up, what's going to happen is that um, the sine terms will cancel out. If you're adding this one to this one, right, then you're left with two, two of these. And then likewise, if we take the difference, okay, so this minus this, the cosine terms will drop out. And so then you're left with minus 2i sine beta x. Actually, sorry, positive there. So this minus this. Okay, so we have 2i sine beta x. Okay. All right. Okay, so let's see. Uh, we have to. So, um, so now, yeah, we can just plug these into here. Okay, so y1, okay, so going back to this form, okay, so what we can do is we can let, um, let's, so in order to make this work, right, in, to, in order to achieve our result, um, we're going to let c2, remember, we're just looking for the most bare, like the bare bone solution, right? Um, so we're going to let C2 and C1 be equal to each other. And we're going to let it be equal to one, okay? So let's do that here. Okay? When we do that, now we can go ahead and work with this, okay? So uh, we're going to end up getting for the first one, right? So, so, right? so letting this be... Right, letting this be so letting these be equal to each other, specifically one, and we get a we get a particular solution out of this. So y one will be e, okay, so to the alpha. I'm going to go ahead and break this up. Plus e to the alpha times e to the i beta x. Okay. So just using right some algebra here, right? Um, you can break these up. And we have the right, and we have the formulations for those. Okay. Um, okay. So we can go ahead and see. let's see what's the best way to go from here. We can go ahead and yeah, let's go ahead and back out each of the alpha x. And 
that notice that this right here is what is to be replaced by this. So we have y1. Y1 equals to e to the alpha x times two times two times cosine beta x. Okay. So all this, right? So basically this is getting replaced by this. Okay. And then we can do the same thing for another. Uh, we can choose another form of this. Uh, particularly, we want to let C2 be negative. So that way we end up getting a difference here. Okay. So let's see. Let's do that. Do that over here. Okay. So let's see. One, sorry, so let's C2 be equal to one and C one equal to minus one. So then we get a specific form out of this. Okay. And so we end up getting, in fact, we can just use what we have over there. Oh, okay. excuse me, Professor. Yes. Huh? Um, I'm just a little bit confused on how you can set C1 and C2 equal to these constants. Oh, that's like, the, this is, so this is a general strategy that's used. And because remember, we have a general solution here, right? Mm -hmm. So what we can do is we can use pieces of that solution in order to achieve what we need. So we can pick, right? So we, we just, we don't care about the, we just want it, you know, we want the most bare bone solution. So we can do this, that's fine. To make okay. yeah. so, so in order to get this, Right. In order to get, ideally, we want to get this into a real value solution. So what we're doing is we're letting, we're forcing certain conditions to make that happen. Oh, okay. You see? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. All right. So, um, and so this will allow us to get basically assuming this, right, or forcing this condition will give us, um, will make us, uh, or let us use this condition. Um, so let's go ahead. Let's do that here. So again, we have this. We plug C1 into here. Let's see. I got to be careful of the order here. Um, so C2. So I want this to be. So I want this to be one, and I want C2 to be negative one. That's on the second term here. So we have e to the alpha, right? Plus i beta times x, and then minus e to the alpha minus i beta. Okay, okay. so we have, all right, so we have y equals two. Again, we can split things up here. We end up, we'll basically end up getting this. Okay, but there's a minus here. So let's go ahead and work that out. Okay. So again, just like before, we can factor out e to the alpha x. Right. Um, so let's do that here. So we end up getting this, right? This form. Okay. So that is going to get replaced by this. Right. And so we end up getting okay, y equals to e to the alpha x times two times i sine beta x. So there's the other form. Okay. Cool. 
Okay, so let's go back up here. Right, so this is what we found, okay? We have Y1, okay? Y1 was here. Uh, there it is. Okay. okay um, we don't need the two here. It's again because we just want the most, we just want the basis form, right? The basis solution. And then Y2, um, again, so this is just a constant. So, um, right? Uh, so we have, so what I'm doing here is this. So let me just kind of back up here. This will be a little bit easier to show. So what we're doing is we can take the linear combinations. So I have C1, okay, so C1, so C1 times Y1, which is uh, here. So I'm gonna put the two in front. Times what, cosine beta X, okay, plus, Okay, uh, C2 of the second one. So we have two C2 i and sine beta x or e, C, e to the alpha x. Okay, so the i, the i is just a constant, right? So this. This becomes, let's call this, uh, not to confuse with, let's call this, uh, let's just call this C and this is C, okay? So you get another, you get a constant here and you get another constant there, okay? So I is technically a constant. So then we end up getting this. So C1 e to the alpha X times cosine beta X plus, C2, okay, so this, get, this all gets absorbed into a constant, e to the alpha x times sine beta x. Okay, so there's the, right, so there's the derivation that we need, okay. That's for case three. So if you have complex conjugate roots, your solution will look like that. So you take, um, you know, Solve your auxiliary equation, right? You get the complex conjugate alpha plus or minus i beta, and you just substitute to here. Yeah. Okay. Not too bad, right? So it's a very really nice application of Euler's identity. So let's look at an example of that. Okay. So let's say. And say we want to solve for this. Uh, we want to find the general solution. Okay. Uh, the general solution of y double prime, y double prime plus y prime plus y equals to zero. Okay. So again, you've basically obtain the, or you can get the auxiliary equation, okay, or something, like I said, sometimes we call it the characteristic equation. So this is gonna be M squared plus M plus one, okay. All right, we can use the quadratic formula, right, to solve this. So B, and then we have B squared. Okay, so two times one. So that's gonna give us, so we get uh, minus root three here divided by two. 
and then we can go ahead and uh, go ahead and split this up. So we have minus three here, right? It's part of the discriminant. So, and so then we can get uh, three uh, root three over two i. So there's alpha, right? So here you have your here's your real part, and here's your imaginary part. Just plug those in. Okay. You're going to get y equals to c1 e to the minus one half x, okay, times cosine of root three over two x plus c2 e to the minus one half x. I mean, if you want, you could factor out e to the minus one half x. That's fine. Okay. It doesn't really matter. And then sine of root three over two x. There it is. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, so the 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 right the point is that right if you're again so we're given a in this case a um, if you have a second order linear homogeneous differential equation right um, you'll write the characters of the equation okay and then based on the discriminant it will tell you which uh, which case to apply okay and then and then you just have to apply this formula directly okay. So what happens if you have something higher order? Remember, so so yeah, so each one of these, like I mentioned a while ago, each one of these you can extend. Okay, um, so let me just kind of summarize that. Okay, so for higher order, okay, for something that's larger than degree two, okay. so in that case, right, if you have, let's say, a, a sub n, Zero y, sorry. Okay. So again, you have these are all um, these coefficients are all real valued here. So if you have a general, this is a general n order linear homogeneous differential equation. Okay. So then what you end up getting, right? You okay, so um, you end up getting an n degree uh, characteristic equation, okay. So you end up getting this. Okay, so this is just a is of n uh, m to the n plus this. Okay, and in this case, we're assuming that you get indistinct, uh, indistinct real solutions. Okay. So assuming that, so assuming that this happens, then you just generalize this case. So your solution, right, will be y equals to say you have c1e to the um, let's say m1x plus c2e to the m2x plus dot dot dot. Okay, so you get so each term. So for each root 
each room has have its own term. Okay, so again, it's just an extension of this right, first case. And if you get, um, so if you get repeated roots, something that is, if you get something larger than multiplicity of two, then again, you can extend this, okay? So that's, that's the first case. The extension of the second case is that, um, right, so if you have M1, Let's say M1 is a root of multiplicity K. Then you just extend on this, okay? So you end up getting Y equals to uh, C1E to the M1X plus C2X times E to the M1X and so on. So the next one will have an X squared in it. So each term you multiply by X. And that way it enforces those terms to be literally independent. Okay. So here we have K and this will be X to the K minus one. So the reason you get up, you only go up to K minus one uh, because because of, you're off by one because of this term, okay? So you have your root and then you have the multiplicity. So for example, if you have a multiplicity of three, okay, then that's gonna bring you up to second, right? So this one, you have this one, then plus this one, plus this one. So the number of terms will be that will depend on the multiplicity. Okay? And then it's kind of a little bit harder to generalize this one. Um, so you have, like you could, it's possible you could have four complex conjugate roots, right? So then you would have one for, you would have for one set, you would have this, the second set, you would have another, this one. And then you could have combinations of these, like sort of hybrids, okay? So you could have, it's possible that you could have uh, real and complex roots, right? I think that can happen, right? Um, because we're working with polynomials. So, um, so then you, you would just say, okay, if you have root roots, okay, let's say they're distinct, you would put this one. If you have, and then for the complex roots, you would work with this one and then put them together, okay? Um, so let me actually see. Yes. So let me go over just one more here. solution okay so again third order right linear homogeneous equation so we're going to formulate the characters of the equation so you have m cubed plus 3m minus all the terms there. So, all right. So this is what we get. Okay. Uh, and that should be. I think that should be double prime. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. So double prime. So m squared here. Okay. So. Um, okay. All right. So. There's a way. There's. There's a way to get this. Okay. Um, if you remember. Um, way back, right, in pre-calculus, right, there's something where you can use, actually, you could use the um, Descartes rule of signs to help you get this root. Um, okay, so if you, if you recall, right, if, if you have two sign changes, right, there's, right, so if you see, there's one sign change and another sign change. So that tells you that there's, 
right? They're going to be two or zero um, positive roots. Okay? And I'm not sure if this shows up very well here. So you have two, okay? you have one, and then two sign changes. Okay, so that means you have two or zero positive roots. Okay. All right. And if you want to see, you know, the number of possible negative roots, then you would just put minus one into there. Right. So this will be minus m cubed. Uh, this would just remain positive, and then you would have minus four. So in this case, you get uh, you have one, right, and then two. So again, it's two or zero negative roots. Okay. All right. Um, let's see one. Oh, what did I say two? Sorry. No, one side. Sorry. But one side. So one positive root. Sorry about that. So one side change. Sorry. For some reason I said two. So one side change means that it's going to be one. So either get one or negative one, which doesn't make sense. So there's definitely one positive root here. And here you get one, two. So two or zero. And this is counting multiplicity, if you recall. Okay. Um, so it turns out that okay, if you right, so you pick a get you basically if you can find a root, then you can start to break this down. Okay. Um, okay, so um, let's try m equals to one. Okay. All right. All right, so we have one, uh, three. There is no m term, and then there's minus four. Okay, so using right using synthetic division. Right, so you basically write down the coefficients here. We have a zero here because there's no m term. I bring this down one, four. Right, you multiply this, put right, put that result here. Multiply this, put the result there. Um, just right, summing these up, so four and four, four times sorry, four times one is four, and you get zero. So Remainder zero, if you recall, that tells you that this is a root. Okay. okay. So then from there, we can see that, right, from here we end up getting uh, this is going to be m squared plus 4m plus 1. And then we can solve for this. So this is going to break down to be m plus 2 squared. Okay. So we have so this is just m equals to minus 2 with multiplicity of 2. So there's your right. So there's your two negative roots. Remember, it counts the multiplicity. So there's two and there's one. So that gives you a total of degree three. So they're all real valued here. All right. So so then we can, based on that, we can um, we can formulate our solution. So this is just going to be y equals two. Uh, we have uh, so we have one. Just we have one distinct root here. So that's going to be y equals two. Let's call that. A constant there, e to the x, okay, and then plus, and then we do it for these for these two. So we have multiplicity of two. So we're gonna have c two e to the minus two x plus another term because of multiplicity of two. So we need to multiply this by x. And there it is. Okay. Yes. How did you know to divide to divide by one? Um, it was a lucky guess. <laughs> yeah. So typically we. So, okay, again, so this was just a safe time. I knew ahead of time it's one, but you can figure out, and there's another way you can do this also, but um, most students remember this part. So um, if you look here, if you take all the possible factors of the four and divide by all the factors, also by all the possible factors of one, that will give you a list of possible rational zeros, right? So you would have right, factors of four, by oh, is it the algebra two theorem? That's like. Yeah, it's from there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It has to do with uh, Descartes. Oh, basically, this is Descartes' rule of change, uh, but some number theory. Right? So you have plus or minus one, and you take the ratio of all these. This is just one. Right. Uh, normally, if you have other factors, you would divide each of these by that, right? 
all, each every combination. So this is not too bad. I remember now. You remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, and also plus or minus four. Right. So typically you would start with one, right? Positive one, then negative one, then you would, that's how I always start with the lowest number, the easiest one, and then slowly work your way up. Um, so once you find one, then you can break it down. All right. Okay, Max? Yeah. Yep, looks good. Yeah, sometimes, yeah, some students kind of forget about this. I have to kind of go over with them. All right. So that is, uh, yeah, so that is homogeneous linear equation with constant coefficients. So next time, so on Thursday, I'm going to talk about what happens if you, if this term is not zero. Okay. So you still have to go through this process. Okay. Um, so you're going to find basically what's called, in the book, they call it the complementary solution, which is the solution to the homogeneous okay, equation. Then you have to use the idea is that depending on what's here, you have to use what's called a trial function. Okay? And that's going to be the basis for the, uh, the non-homogeneous part. Okay? And then you basically, what you do is you substitute that, you pick the, basically pick a general form of whatever is here. And I have some, I have like a handout for that. And then you put it back into here. And then from there, you can figure out the specific coefficients. And that will give you the particular solution. Okay? And then you take the complementary. So then you get the overall solution, right? So you take the complementary solution plus add it to the particular solution to get the, the, the general solution. Right. And then there's another way you can do this, right? Uh, using, using the idea of the Roskin. Okay? All right, so any questions on that? Okay. Uh, I guess I'll see you on Thursday.